So we have been going through a study in the book of Hebrews, and we've w made our way up to chapter number 9, chapter number 9. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews. I'm going to do just a brief review, actually, of just last week. I'm not going to kind of back us all the way up through the book of Hebrews. If uh, you do want to catch up on the series, you can always go to our website, uh, mynorthwinds.org. And you can go to the media link there, and it'll have all of the sermon archives. And you can certainly catch up on the lessons that we have been studying in the book of Hebrews. Uh, but we are in uh, Hebrews chapter number 9, the second part. And we're going to talk today about Jesus being a greater mediator. You'll know that our entire study is on, in the book of Hebrews is on Jesus being greater. Okay, and so it's just showing the supremacy of Christ. That like other things are here and they might be great things, but then you have Jesus that is way up here. And so it's been a challenging and I hope a fun series as we've been going through it. Just a reminder from last week. Remember that the tabernacle on earth, it's simply a shadow of the real deal in heaven. Okay, so the one on earth is this just a shadow. It's just a, a preview, if you will. And so it said, listen, Moses had to construct the tabernacle according to everything that God had shown him. And what God had shown him is like, here's the real deal. I want the one on earth to be a reflection or to be a shadow or to be a copy of it. So we looked through that a little bit last week. The high priest... The high priest would enter the most holy place. Some people would call this the holy of holies. The high priest would enter that only one time a year. Only one time a year. And what we saw last week in chapter number 9, the first part, is that when the high priest would go in just one time a year, the Holy Spirit was showing that the way to the, and I just put it as the most, most holy place. Remember how I said you have the earthly tabernacle. It's a shadow of the real deal. So there's a holy of holies or the most holy place in the earthly tabernacle. But again, the earthly one is just a shadow. So the holy of holies in the real deal, which is in heaven, I just kind of dubbed that one the most, most holy place. That's like the holiest holy of holies. Does that make sense? And so it was saying, listen, the way into the most, most holy place, the way into the presence of God, it had not yet been revealed until Jesus came and he opened up that way. And so that was last week, and, and we said, listen, whenever Jesus came and he gave us the way into the most, most holy place, what he did is he gave us access to the Father, complete access, total access, and, and, and it's not like just a partial type thing. You can go to God any time you want because of the person of Jesus Christ. It says that he always lives to make intercession for us. And so just kind of backing up and, and seeing a couple of the verses from last week, verse number 11, when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Now we already know that one's where it's in heaven, right? Because we had the earthly one that's a shadow, and then we had the heavenly one that's the real deal. So he didn't go through the earthly one. He went through the heavenly one. It says that's the tabernacle that's not man-made. That's to say it's not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of, go of goats and calves, and that's the way that the earthly high priest would. But he entered the most, most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Now, this is about three weeks in a row that we've been seeing this forever, this eternal, uh, so, so forever, uh, eternal, not having an end. And so he says, I, he obtained that eternal redemption. And so it gave us unlimited access to the Father. That's, that's just awesome. We talked and we joked a little bit last week about uh, Verizon's commercial, that you get to choose your unlimited plan. And with, with God, you don't have to choose your unlimited plan. You just have unlimited. So you don't have to choose, well, like, I'll have unlimited access to God on holidays, um, or I'll have ac uh, unlimited access to God when I'm praying for my kids, or I want unlimited access and you have to choose. No, you get unlimited access to the Father because of the person of Jesus Christ. That's why he's greater. And so the very last verses we looked at last week said this, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean. And if you're reading that, you're like, that doesn't, that doesn't seem to make much sense. This would have been the Old Testament ritual um, as it related to the law, okay? And so don't worry about all the details of that. If you want to study it, you certainly can. But it said, 
that blood that was sprinkled on those that were ceremonially unclean, it sanctified them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more, though, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, how much more will he cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? And again, Jesus is a greater sacrifice. That was last week. He's a greater sacrifice. This week, we're all about Jesus being a greater mediator. And so we read the very next verse in Hebrews 9, 15. For this reason, Christ is the mediator. Everybody say mediator. mediator. Now, that sounds a little bit like meteor, but he's not a mediator or he's not a meteor flying through the sky. He's a mediator. Okay, so he's the mediator of a new covenant. Two weeks ago, we talked about this new covenant. So Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. You see that eternal again? It just seems to be popping up everywhere. Everybody say eternal. Okay, so we have Christ as the mediator, and he's the mediator of a new covenant that gives us eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Let's just look real quickly uh, about what a mediator is now that i've thought about the two words together i'm going to be like meteor mediator um so so yeah as you go home and you talk to your parents about it if your parents aren't here or if you go home and you discuss things as a family we're talking about him being a mediator and that just means that he is one who has a go-between or i really like this definition here and i just looked up the definition of a mediator um it's a person who attempts to make people involved in a conflict come to an agreement. Two people are having a conflict, right? Anybody ever have a conflict? <laughs> the rest of you are lying. <laughs> I get people to tell me this all the time. I wouldn't lie to you in church, Pastor Dave. You're in church. <laughs> Every time somebody says that to me, I'm like, so, like, if we were not at church, you'd be okay lying to me? Like, I'm not quite sure that I get this completely, but nevertheless, so... We've all had conflicts, right? Conflicts arise between at least two people. I mean, I guess you can have an internal conflict with yourself, but typically a conflict is taking place with at least two people. It could be more than two people, but at least two people. A mediator is one who comes in and tries to be the go-between, tries to be the one who gets these two parties, these two people, these two countries, these two whatever, to be able to be reconciled together. He's a mediator. Any of you growing up ever find yourself... Now, listen, if you're sitting beside your parents, you may not want to raise your hand at this point. But for those of you that are now adults, okay, so I'm just going to eliminate children from this conversation. Okay, so, so nobody under the age of 18 is allowed to raise your hand whenever I ask this question. I'm just going to... I'm trying to eliminate family conflict, Okay. But any of you that are adults, were you ever the mediator between mom and dad? How many of you, like in your family growing up, you were the mediator between mom and dad? One, two, nobody else. That's surprising to me. Okay, we got another one over here. All right. Now, this is a little dangerous for me because sometimes my parents will go back and watch the messages that I preach. So here goes mom and dad. Um, <laughs> The reality is, is that as I was growing up, I was often that mediator between my mom and dad. If there was a conflict, for some reason or another, things that seemed very clear to me weren't so clear to them. So for instance, and I may have told you this story before, I'm not, I'm not sure, but this is my favorite one. Okay, so my parents, uh, they had a joint checking account. Which means that whenever you pay for something, whether with a debit card or with a check, it comes out of the same account, right? Okay, so, so keep in mind, my parents have a joint checking account. We pull into the BP gas station in Carrollton. That's where I grew up. Well, I grew up in Kilgore, but there was no gas station in Kilgore. That's way too small. Okay, but so we pull into the BP gas station in Carrollton. My dad gets out. And he wants to pay for the gas. So, so our family, we typically had two cars, mom's car and dad's car. Now, it didn't mean that dad couldn't drive mom's car or mom, mom couldn't drive dad's car, but it was just generally the one that they drove, and probably chances are pretty good. You guys have similar type arrangements, right? And so, so we're in my dad's car, 
and my dad's like, okay, I'm going to get out and pay for the gas. But my mom wanted to pay for the gas because my mom would only give my dad a certain amount of money for the week. And so that was kind of his, like, allowance, so to speak. I, it wasn't as if my mom was trying to withhold anything, but it's like he would often work away. And so she gave him, like, she would put the check in the bank because I see some of you look like, wow, your mom sounds mean. My mom's not mean at all. Uh, this is just, so he would be out of town, and he would pay for things with cash. And so every week he would give him, my mom would give him a certain amount. Well, my dad wanted to pay for the gas. And my mom was like, no, I only gave you so much. Let me pay for the gas. Now, again, they have a what? They have a joint checking account. So all the money's really coming from the exact same place. I kid you not, we're half an hour. We lived a half an hour away from Carrollton. They fought from the BP gas station all the way home. And at home, they're still arguing. And so at this point, I'm like, all right, here's the deal. And I honestly, I don't even remember which one paid. But somebody won, and they got the pay, and the other one argued the rest of the way. And so what I did when I went home, I said, listen, here's the deal, Mom and Dad. You have a joint checking account. If it makes you feel better, one of you pay me the amount you paid for gas. The other one already paid. You both lose the money, and everybody's happy. Okay? I didn't get that money, but, but like it was fairly regular that in our household— like if my mom was having a hard time with my brother, I was the mediator. Like, mom, here's what Chris is trying to say. Chris, here's what mom's trying to say. Dad, here's what mom's trying to say. Mom, here's what dad's trying to say. You're actually not all that far apart. Like, and, and if you would just do this, then it would probably help things to smooth over a little bit. And so I grew up kind of being the mediator in our family. Uh, gave me good practice, right? Gave me good practice. And so, so it, it, it was one of those things where two parties, two people who were at odds with each other, the goal of the mediator is to bring them together. Now, Jesus is the mediator. Who's he trying to bring together? We said this a few weeks ago, and it's hard for some people to process this. But the reason that anyone needs salvation is because God has been offended by the sins of mankind. God cannot simply accept the sins of mankind and so there needed to be a payment that was made to satisfy his justice to satisfy god's wrath against sinful man it had to be made so why do you need saved you need saved from the wrath of god some of you are like well no 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 that it doesn't work that way god is only loving haven't you ever read john three sixteen, pastor dave i i have read john three sixteen. And, and so often what we try to do is we try to make God to be like an unbalanced God. Like he has to only be loving, which means, and, and this is where we're so off, you can't be loving and you can't be firm and just at the same time. That's kind of in our mind. And so that's why sometimes we get parents that they are, they are unwilling or absolutely refuse to have any standards for their children because to have standards for their children and to hold their children to their standards, that, that'd be mean, and I'm a loving parent. Now, it sounds pretty flawed whenever we talk about it that way, right? <laughs> like, oh, no, but it's okay for God to have a holy standard. And it's okay for him to say, anyone who doesn't measure up to that standard, my wrath is going to be poured out against them. Now, there's no way that we can in and of ourselves measure up to that standard, and so we needed someone to be able to bring God and man together. Someone who could, what's it say in God's word? Give us his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. When that gets applied to your account, then you are declared not guilty. You are declared righteous. You are declared just. You are declared holy on the basis not of what you have done, but on the basis of Christ's sacrifice. So we talked about his sacrifice last week, and his sacrifice allows him to be the mediator, the one who brings sinful man and a holy God together. Does this make sense? If it does, say it does. Wow, okay, good. All right, so, so this is what we have this great mediator in Christ who is seeking to bring together a holy God and sinful man into a relationship. That's the beauty of what Jesus has done for us. And so if you don't get anything else for the rest of the day, hang on to the beauty of Jesus being a greater mediator than ever there was before. 
And not only that, but he's the final mediator. There's not going to need to be another high priest that is going to go into the Holy of Holies, going to go into the most holy place. There isn't going to need to be another high priest. Jesus is our eternal, there's that word again, high priest. And so he's made this on our behalf, and he's our perfect mediator. Well, I want to back up into Ezekiel chapter number 18, because I want us to see how important it is that Jesus did this once for all, that he made this sacrifice once for all. Because again, what, this, what the author of Hebrews is doing is he's comparing the old and the new. And at this point, he's comparing the old covenant and the new covenant. The mediator of the old covenant would have been the high priest. The high priest would have been the one who went in once a year and made a sacrifice into the Holy of Holies. Jesus made his sacrifice once for all. Just once. But let's look at the way that it was done in the, under the Old Covenant. Let, Ezekiel chapter number 18. If you have your Bibles, again, I encourage you to turn there. And this might be one that you might have to go back and you might have to read through a couple of times. But what's, like when you compare this to Hebrews 9, it's like, wow. Oh my goodness, I, I get that. At least I think that's what's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, just read it a couple times, then it'll happen. You'll be like, wow, that makes sense. And don't you love it when the Bible makes sense? Anybody ever felt as if the Bible sometimes doesn't make sense? Anybody ever feel that way? Raise your hand. Yeah? All right. So, so I know that sometimes people feel that way. I think that this is going to be like, I get it. This makes sense. Ezekiel 18, starting in verse number 1. The word of the Lord came to me. Talking about Ezekiel. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? And here's the proverb that they quoted. The fathers eat sour grapes... And the children's teeth are set on edge. All right, now let's just think about that proverb for a second. The father eats sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on it ed- set on edge. If I if I had to like give you an opportunity to like try to think of what in the world is it talking about there? Anybody that just like for for me usually proverbs just like oh that makes sense. All right, I got that. This one here I kind of had to like. I'm not sure exactly what it's trying to say. So I had, obviously I can't just go, I, I don't get it, so just move on. But whenever it says that the fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, what it's, what it's trying to relate is that what happens to the father, the children end up being the recipient of whether, in this case, the, the bad deeds of the father get passed down to their children. So whenever you think about eating something sour, what happens? Right? It causes your teeth. Think about it. Your teeth kind of get set on edge. So it's, oh, and you find your teeth kind of lining up, don't you? Yeah, and so it's saying like, okay, but, but the children aren't the one eating the grapes, the sour grapes. It's saying the father eats the grapes, and the children just get stuck with it. The father... He does evil deeds, and so the children reap those evil deeds, and they, they, they get all the punishment from that. And so God is saying, and just, just this isn't me saying, this is God saying, what do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? He's trying to say, and he goes on to say in verse 3, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. Stop saying that the kids... They're that way because of their parents. Stop saying that I'm going to judge the kids based on what the parents have done. Stop saying that. Don't say it anymore. And it goes on and it explains. And I just, it, this is like one of the, I, I would imagine you read through Ezekiel, you're going to get confused at a number of spots. However, this one makes complete sense. So, for every living soul belongs to me. Uh, wow, I didn't spell that right. The father as well as the son. Both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. Everybody say personal responsibility. You're like, you don't usually make us say such long words. Uh, Say that one more time, though. Say personal responsibility. responsibility. All right, good. The soul who sins is the one who will die. The sinner gets punished for their sin the the soul who sins is the one who would die and then he goes on just in case we don't get it suppose there's a righteous man who does what is just and right 
He does not eat at the mountain shrines or look to the idols of the house of Israel. And then it gives, verses 7 and 8, and if you have your Bibles open, it just gives a list of the righteous things that he does. So suppose you have this person, and he follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. Verse number 10, suppose he has a violent son who sheds blood or does any of these other things, though the father has done none of them. He eats at the mountain shrines. He defiles his neighbor's wife. And then verse 12 gives a list of additional wicked deeds. It goes on to say, will such a man live? Basically, just because the father is righteous, does that mean that even though the son is being wicked, that the, that the son is declared righteous? So what, what happens to the father gets passed down to the son. God is saying, will such a man who is wicked, even though the, he's the son of a righteous man, will that person live? And it says he will not. Everybody say personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. Because he has done all these detestable things, he will surely be put to death and his blood will be on his own head. But suppose this son has a son. So now we've got father has a son the son has a son suppose this son has a son who sees all the sins that his father commits and though he sees them he does not do such things he does not eat at the mountain shrines in verse 50 verses 15 and 16 it gives the list of wicked deeds that he doesn't do and so we get into verse number 17 and it says that this the father's son and the son is now as a son the son was wicked the son's son is not he keeps my laws and follows my decrees he will not die for his father's sin he will surely live everybody say personal responsibility. personal responsibility but his father will die for his own sin everybody say personal responsibility, personal responsibility. because he has practiced extortion robbed his brother and did what was wrong among his people yet you ask why does the son not share in the guilt of his father since the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to keep all my decrees he will surely live everybody say personal responsibility the soul who sins is the one who will die. Everybody say personal responsibility. personal responsibility. The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. Everybody say personal responsibility. personal responsibility. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against him. Everybody say personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. At this point, you're like, will you just stop making us say personal responsibility? But if a wicked man turns away from all the sins he has committed and keeps all my decrees and does what is just and right, he will surely live. He will not die. None of the offenses he has committed will be remembered against him because of the righteous things he has done. He will live. Now it goes on and it explains that if a righteous person decides to then live wicked, that that person will then be punished. And so if a wicked person turns from his ways, God says, you know what? I will forgive him. And if a righteous person turns from their ways and says, you know what? I'm going to hold that against him. It's personal responsibility. That's what it is. And so God says, listen, you have been saying, I am the way that I am because of my father. I'm going to continue in this wickedness because of my father. I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing this. And so what they were doing, each generation could do what? They blame the previous one. Every generation blames the one before them. I would imagine that somewhere in the counseling realm, there's something called blame shifting. And whether or not in the counseling realm or elsewhere, it is so much easier to pass the buck. It's somebody else's fault. Now, I do realize that there is... There is a, a, a way of tracing back and realizing, and actually Jim and I just talked about this this week, and seeing like, okay, this is like the hub of where all of my protectiveness comes from. This is the hub of where my distrust comes from. This is the hub of, but the reality of your situation and my situation is this. You will give an account to God for exactly one person. And if you are holding a mirror, you will be able to see that person. You're going to give an account to God, and that's going to be actually the very last verse that we're going to look at in Hebrews 9. You're going to give an account to God for exactly one person. That's you. And I strongly encourage you not to say, well, I am the way that I am because of my dad. I am the way that I am because of my mom. Now, listen, are there some things that get passed down as far as character, personality? Absolutely. But we are all personally responsible to God. Everybody say personal responsibility. 
you, me, everyone, we are personally responsible to God. I had somebody tell me, a teenager one time, I asked him, I said, you know, do you know the Lord? Are you a Christian? He's like, yeah, I am. I said, well, tell me about the time when you, you place your faith in Jesus. And he's like, well, my mom told me that we're Christians. I'm like, wait a second. Your mom told you that your family's Christians. Yeah, my mom just said, hey, we are Christians. And so I'm a Christian. Listen, you no more become a Christian because your parents declare you to be a Christian than you become wicked because your parents are wicked. We all have an individual personal responsibility to God. And so listen, young people, if you're in here today and you're saying, listen, I've grown up in a Christian home, that is a tremendous blessing. If you have grown up in a Christian home, it is a, a blessing beyond what you will realize for a long time, okay? I am now 40, and the longer I live, the older that I get, the more thankful I am for the Christian heritage that I have, the way that my parents raised me in church, uh, the way that they disciplined me, the way that they set me on a good path to get things started. I know that there are a lot of people in here who, who don't have that, who don't have that. I see some of you in here who you do have that, and you might not overwhelmingly be thankful for it. The time will come. But young person who has grown up in a Christian home, you are personally accountable to God for your own faith and so I need you to ask yourself this question has there been a time in your life when you said Jesus I I as a young person I as in fill in your name I trust you as my savior it's not that I'm a Christian because my family's a Christian I choose to place my faith in the finished work of Jesus adult I ask you that same question. Has there been a time when you placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus? Because you were personally accountable to God for that. And so that's what Ezekiel 18 was relaying to us. It's saying, listen, okay, under the old covenant, the soul who sins, it will die. And so if somebody sinned, and the high priest had to offer a sacrifice, or the priest had to offer a sacrifice to make them right with God again. If that person continued in their sin, then God says, I will hold that sin against them. Under the new covenant, we have a mediator who has offered an eternal sacrifice. We, I don't think, completely understand the enormity of the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant between the sacrifice that a high priest made and the sacrifice that Jesus made because when Jesus made an eternal sacrifice once for all that means that once you have placed your faith in him you are eternally not guilty eternally why because if you if you bounce between guilty not guilty what would Jesus have to do he would have to be going back in and offering himself as a sacrifice again. That's what the high priest had to do. That's what the Old Testament under the Old Covenant, that's what they had to do. We're going to turn that thing off so it doesn't just keep... Wah, 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 thanks. Um, <laughs> technology glitches, you got to love them, right? So under the Old Covenant, that's what would happen. And that's what was talking about in Ezekiel 18. If a person lives righteously then you know what? They are declared righteous. But if that person then decides, okay, I'm going to rebel and sin against God, then that person is guilty and a sacrifice needs to be made on their behalf again. But under the new covenant, the eternal sacrifice has been offered once for all. And here's the really cool thing, and I don't even have time to delve into this this morning. We'd be here for a lot longer. But what you can actually look back and what you can see is that when Jesus offered his sacrifice, when he offered himself as a sacrifice, it actually paid for the sins under the old covenant. That just... So, so he paid for the sins that took place in the past, and he paid for the sins that would take place yet in the future, and everyone who places their faith in him is declared eternally not guilty. Now, some people who have grown up in church, they just can't stand this. They're like, but if you tell people that they are eternally not guilty, then they'll just go do whatever they want. They'll just feel as if they have a license to sin. And I don't know about you, 
but I have never felt that way. When I look at how my sin separated me from a holy God, when I look at the fact that he came and he was willing to suffer and he went to the cross on my behalf, when I look at that and I realize that, that I could be lost forever except for the sacrifice of Jesus, once he applied his blood to my account, I feel forever in this debt. I don't want to go on sinning. That's what once separated us. Why would I want to go back to that? Now, some of you in here, you've experienced the pleasures of sin for a short period of time. But if you have any age on you at all, you'll know that God's word is exactly right when it says that the pleasures of sin are only for a short time. Because sin always has consequences. Sin always leads to destruction. It always leads to separation. It always leads to hurt. It always leads to guilt. And so why would we want to go back and live in that any longer? And so even though I know that I'm eternally secure as a result of the sacrifice of Jesus, like, I I just don't want to go back to who I was and, and so the, the truth of God's word is, is very clear and that is that he has offered the eternal sacrifice as we wrap up Ezekiel 18 it says God says do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked like that's not what brings me pleasure Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? <laughs> In verse 30, he just kind of brings it all together. Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one according to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Listen, if you're in here today, I, I would just plead with you, much as it is said here, like, listen, why don't you turn from your ways and turn to Jesus? I'm not talking about just coming to church. I, I really am not. Please, please. Young people who have grown up in church and you've just gotten into the habit of going to church and maybe you listen and maybe you don't, and maybe you process and maybe you don't, I need you to at least process this. I need you to process this. Have you turned from your sin and have you turned to Jesus as your Savior? I'm not asking whether you grow up in a Christian home. I'm not asking whether or not your parents are, are Christians. I'm, I'm not asking anything like that. I'm asking, have you had a time in your life? And you don't have to remember the exact date. I remember the exact date for me. I grew up in a Christian home, and yet I grew up all the way. I was in high school before I turned my life over to Jesus. I went to a Christian school. I actually left that Christian school before I ever turned my life over to Jesus. I could have quoted Bible verses. I could have quoted all of Hebrews chapter number 11. I could have quoted many passages of Scripture. But I had never personally placed my faith in Jesus. I hadn't. I had listened. I had processed. I knew. But I had never never place my faith in jesus so if you're here today can you remember back to the time when you said jesus i want you to be my savior i turn from my sin and i turn to you july the 28th 1993 that was my day again you don't have to remember your exact day i wrote mine in the front of my bible and so i see it often so that's why i know the exact day it was a wednesday i could even tell you who was preaching uh, Pastor Scott, I was at a, I was Camp Kobiak in Michigan. Um, I was sitting down front, and I thought I knew it all. I really did. I was a teenager. Most teenagers think they know it all, right? And you're like, well, wait, I don't think I know it all. I know it all. I thought I knew it all, but I didn't know Jesus. So listen, young people, adults, can you, can you just process for a moment? Have you had a, a time in your life when you, you said, Jesus, I turn from my sin, I turn to you. I need you to be my savior if not today's your day turn from your sin turn to him he said i thought i thought we were preaching out of hebrews well we are we are but it took us back there it took us back to ezekiel for a moment and i'm about done i'm about done hebrews 9 verse 15 for this reason christ is the mediator of a new covenant that's what we just talked about that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So that's, remember how I said, even the sins that are in the past, the sins that were con committed under the first covenant, the old covenant, he took care of those too. So the old covenant, the soul that sins, it will die. The new covenant, those who are called receive the promised eternal inheritance. Under the old covenant, a person's eternity was kind of up in the air, you might say. Okay, because if a person, they sin and they continue to sin, God said, I'm going to hold that guilt against you. If a person lived a righteous life, God says, I declare you righteous. If a righteous person decided they were going to live uh, a wicked and, and sinful life, God says, I'm going to turn against that person. I'm going to remember their sin. But in the new 
in the new covenant, under the new covenant, anyone who has had the blood of Jesus applied to their account is eternally secure. Everybody say personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. Everybody say eternally secure. Eternally secure. So if Jesus' blood, and he, I don't know if you noticed this when we were singing, but the, the three songs right before I preached, they all had to do with the blood of Jesus. They all had to do with Jesus sacrificing on our behalf. If his blood has been applied to your account through, your, through faith in him, you're eternally, eternally secure. Continuing on, in the case of a will, how many of you have a will? Oh, man. Well, put your hand up again. How many of you adults have a will? Oh, okay. A, a few more of you. I'm, I'm not trying to be hard on you or anything like that, but it would be wise, especially if you have children. It would be wise to go ahead and, and put a will together. Legal Zoom. Uh, my wife and I use that really, really cheap. Uh, I encourage you, get a will. Just, just saying that has nothing to do with anything I'm preaching about other than this. Okay, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. In other words, you can't execute the will if the person is still living. Um, well, listen, my mom and dad's will, it says that my brother gets half and I get half, and so I know they're still alive, but we just want to execute the will and take all their money. You can't do that, right? In the case of a will, it's necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. And you say, but there's such a thing as a living will. I, I know you can, you can get your way around this, but you understand what it's saying. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop. And he sprinkled the blood on the scroll and all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. And so if you can kind of picture uh, a piece of hyssop, it's kind of like a, a, a little short, um, I hate to say branch, but uh, there's probably a better way to, to put it. But it, it's kind of got some, uh, oh man, what's the best way to explain that? Uh, just kind of, it's got some, uh, what's that? Fronds? What's, well, I, don't, well, I don't even know what fronds are. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Anybody ever heard of fronds? Everybody except for me? Okay, so you can kind of picture... Uh, I just, just never heard of fronds. I think there's fronds drilling around this place, right? Isn't there? <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so they take this and they sprinkle it. And they do this uh, through the tabernacle on, all, on everything. Okay, so they're, they're, di they're dipping it in the blood and sprinkling. Okay, so they, they put it on everything. And it says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things. Why are they copies? This is the earthly tabernacle, right? It's a shadow. It's a copy of what's actually in heaven. So it's necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But there's an actual real tabernacle in heaven, right? And so the heavenly things themselves, they needed to then be purified by a greater sacrifice. In other words, not the blood of the calves and the goats and, and the, anything like that, but the heavenly things, they, they needed to be cleansed with a better sacrifice than these for Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. Remember how I said if things were the way that they were under the old covenant, uh, old covenant and you bounce between forgiven and unforgiven, then Christ would have to go offer himself again for you because that's what the priest and that's what the high priest would do. They would offer sacrifices on your behalf. But the fact that Jesus offered his sacrifice once for all, once for all, you're going to hear that again and again, once for all, he offered it once for all. And so the fact that he made his way and he entered heaven to offer himself not again and again, he didn't do that, the way that the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own, then Christ would have had, if this was the case, if he had to go back and forgive people's sins again and again and again, then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all. Everybody say once for all. Now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And you say, whoa, whoa, take away the sins of many people. I thought he died for everyone. He did. 
So process for just a moment. Why is he only taking away the sins of many people? Unfortunately, not everyone places their faith in his finished work. There are people that he has died for who refuse to turn to him. There are people that he desires to forgive, and they say, I'll do life on my own. I don't need Jesus. Who are you to tell me that I need to, I need to turn, turn my life over to Jesus, that I need to place my faith in him? Who are you to tell me that? I'm not anybody. I'm not anybody. But God's word makes very clear that sin has separated us from a holy God. And the way that we have been brought together is through our perfect mediator, Jesus Christ. So listen, he was sacrificed to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So here are the takeaways. Number one, after death, we will face judgment. Unless the rapture happens, folks, before we die, we're all going to come to that point. I tell you guys this often, and I, I get those who are up in, up in years that tell me, Pastor Dave, don't get old. And I tell them the same thing, right? By now you know what that is. The only other option is dying. I'll take getting old. Well, allow me to get old. I don't mind getting old. But after death, which we will all face, we are going to face judgment. We are either going to face God, and he is going to declare us not guilty on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, which has been applied to our account, or he is going to declare us guilty because we refused the sacrifice of Jesus. You are only in one of two camps today. I need you to get this. I, I, my heart just hurts for those who don't know Jesus. If you're here today and you have never placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus, please reach out to him today. It doesn't take a complicated prayer. It can be as simple as, Jesus, I know I need you. I want you to be my Savior. Please save me now. It can be as simple as that. But listen, after death, we're going to face judgment. So I asked the question, has Jesus' blood been applied to your account? And I've asked that a lot today. Number three, if it has, you're eternally secure, not on the basis of anything that I say, but on the basis of God's word and Jesus' finished work. That's why you're eternally secure. And then the final thing is this. If it hasn't, reach out to him today. Okay? So, Father, thanks for allowing us to open your word and study your word. I trust that even though, even though we went through a lot today, I trust that the simplicity of what we, what we talked about out of your word would be very clear. Under the old covenant, Father, we know that those who lived righteously were declared righteous. And as it says, the soul that sins, it will die. And those who rebelled against you, they were held accountable for that. And if they decided, those that were righteous, they decided, you know what, I'm going to live a wicked life, then, then you held that against them. And those who were wicked, if they turned to you, then you accepted them. And, and so it could bounce back and forth. But under the new covenant, the covenant of which you, Jesus, are the mediator on behalf of mankind and God bringing us together, you offered yourself as a sacrifice once for all so that you could declare everyone who has placed their faith in you as eternally not guilty. Lord, I pray for anyone in here today who has not reached out to you in faith. I pray that they would just pray a simple prayer of faith such as this. Jesus, I know my sin separates me from God. But I believe you died to bring me and God together. So right now, I ask you to forgive my sins. And I ask you to be my Savior. To apply your sacrifice to my account. In Jesus' name, amen.